All right. A healthy diet is very important for aging. It's important at all times of life. But as we get older, it becomes more on our minds, definitely. We have learning objectives today and to explain the importance of consuming all essential nutrients, which seems to no longer be understood by a large portion of the population. Adequate calories. It seems like a lot of people are just decreasing calories, thinking that a leaner weight is what is equal to health. We want to show how these essential nutrients actually change as we do get older. That's important because if people are eating less, as I've heard in various media television shows, that's an issue. Provide you with a basic guideline for choosing a healthy diet and stress the importance of exercise. We all need exercise. Now, if you're like me, as you know, I'm older than a number of you in this audience, I can see, you know, things that are on our mind are memory, especially that short term memory, depression, sleep issues, vision. Obviously, cataracts, immaculate degeneration are on the increase as we age. Mobility and strength and GI tract problems. How frequently we have to go to the bathroom or not go to the bathroom. Pain, obviously, and joints and spine. But we've also got disease conditions, arthritis, cancer, heart problems, stroke, osteoporosis, and sexuality. All of these things are concerns that probably aren't on on the minds of many of the younger individuals. Now, many think that nutrition is about eating more fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Most of the messages on the Internet, on the TV news, every place you hear is about that and staying away from snack foods, junk foods, eggs, meat. Remove all fat, all sodium from the diet. They'd be wrong. That is not what nutrition science has shown at all. They would be wrong, and they're basing it on large epidemiology studies, which are statistics of groups, not of individuals. We know what certain requirements are for individuals based on height, weight, age, activity level. So nutritional science for successful aging has three key components. Adequate essential nutrients maintains homeostasis, and I'll talk about what that means. Foods containing bioavailable essential nutrients, another key word you should always be thinking about when you're thinking about nutrition. And then that adequate exercise to maintain both muscle and the immune system critical for that mobility, and also for the overall health. So the single most important concept relating to healthy aging, relating to nutrition at any age, is homeostasis. So what does that really mean, that word? As defined, it's the body components remain constant in amount, chemical composition, with literally constant turnover. So you look at your neighbor, you look at the person next to you, they look the same last week. Are they? Homeostasis is a dynamic state. We're a bag of chemicals. Lots of people say, oh, everybody's different. We don't know much about nutrition. Yes, 50 years ago, we knew what we know today, plus a lot more. And even then, we knew lots of the requirements. We've got these chemical reactions, and we all have these chemical reactions. The speed of some of them may be slower or faster in individuals, but we've got these chemical reactions with few exceptions. There are a few genetic differences, but on a whole We've got all of these. And therefore, these chemical reactions are all related to the nutrients we eat because that's where these chemicals come from. 
Homeostasis allows the body to regulate a constant internal temperature. And you hear about that most. Or have a normal blood composition. We're constantly turning over to try to maintain a normalcy with the environment. Repair and rejuvenate itself. Hmm. I think we all want to rejuvenate some of ourselves so that our gastrointestinal tract works right and our skin and our hair production is normal. Respond appropriately to both internal and environmental changes. So as an example, when we were younger, if we were thirsty, we knew we had to drink. But actually that thirst only kicks in when you're younger, when you're already down in fluid quite a bit, quite a bit. Also, the speed to turn on blood clotting. If we didn't have these chemical reactions happening in our body continuously, if we cut ourselves, by the time they could turn on, we would have already bled too much. So we need to be able to turn on blood clotting quickly. That's what homeostasis allows us to do. But healthy aging requires that continuous supply of essential nutrients to be able to do an energy to be able to maintain that homeostasis, all right? So aging or aging and disease will occur. Now, lots of times people don't quite understand. They think they have to just have calcium for their skeleton. And most of us realize that we get shorter as we age. But the skeleton, we've got healthy bone, which is our thicker skeleton, but it's based on a protein matrix. Without adequate protein, the skeleton is going to get thinner no matter how much calcium you have. And so typically you've got the healthy bone, the osteoporotic bone, and here there's a lot less of that protein matrix to hold on to calcium. The calcium in your skeleton today was not there seven years ago. The calcium in your skeleton today will not be there in seven years. Therefore, pretty much on a daily basis, we need to get the calcium. We can't go five days without calcium and then just really have a whole lot on a weekend. Or, and that's with most nutrients. You literally have to have it nearly every day. The gastrointestinal tract now, which is really in in one area of medicine called functional medicine, will make up our health. How do we absorb those nutrients? Those cells turn over every three days, and they're primarily protein, every three days. So when we look at normal intestinal lining, there's lots of surface area, and so the nutrients that we consume, we can absorb more readily. It's not in your body until it's absorbed. You may eat it, but it may go right through and have no potential benefit to the body. So it has to be absorbed. When there's inadequate protein, you have the chance of actually starting to get allergies from food because different proteins can actually go through the membrane directly and not, in fact, get Digest it adequately in the stomach, and the, the larger protein goes through, and then all of a sudden you start having reactions to certain foods. Iron deficiency is, in fact, the um, bottom slides. The first slide here is actually a child, and that's an iron deficiency. Although some gastroenterologists that we showed this to went, oh, That looks like celiac. Well, no, it's iron deficiency. And in fact, the cells will elongate. Iron is also a very critical part of the health of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, some of the things that happen in homeostasis during aging is our metabolic rate, how much much energy we need, goes down. Our maximum heart rate before problems happen goes down. Our resting cardiac heart output goes down. Our muscle strength goes down. Our bone mineral mass goes down. 
This is all depressing. Our, you know, our maximum cardiac output, how hard we can work, our vital capacity, our work capacity, all seem to go down. Our heart weight gets larger and heavier. Our diastolic blood pressure, that's that second number in your blood pressure reading, goes up. Body weight goes up, heart volume goes up, and blood volume goes down. But that doesn't have to happen. Interesting enough, when you look at individuals with good muscle mass, these things don't happen at that same rate. They happen very slowly. So the more you maintain your muscle and your blood volume, the less these things happen. And the more active you can be and mobile and and agile and less pain, etc. What are essential nutrients? I'm always shocked that I would say the majority of individuals today, maybe you're different because you, all of us came up in a different generation. Today you say to a class, what are essential nutrients? And they go, oh, something I need to get in the diet. And then when I'm meeting with them in clinic, because I'm the clinical nutritionist at the university, they'll go, oh, well, you need it in the diet. Well, you don't have it in your diet. Oh, well, I don't need it. Uh, Didn't you just tell me essential nutrient, you need it in the diet? Oh, yeah, but I don't need it. What does essential mean to the younger generation? Well, there's an essential lingerie. There's essential. There are all kinds of words for essential, but they don't get the concept of an essential nutrient. You need it in the diet pretty much every day. Simple. So essential nutrients are required from the diet for normal function. We can't make them. We don't photosynthesize like plants. We need them in the diet. Water, protein, which are really amino acids, carbohydrate, fat, vitamins, and minerals. And we've got the protein, carbohydrate, and fat contain calories. Now, alcohol also contains calories, but it is not an essential nutrient. (laughs) Let me just make that clear. It can relax you. That might be good but it's not an essential nutrient. So I just put this slide there so you would have, we've got a lot of essential nutrients. And there are certain amino acids that are primarily um, or higher amounts in certain foods. Animal products have more of the essential amino acids than plant foods do. And there are essential fatty acids. Anyone who is now eating a fat-free diet is going to end up in trouble. We've also got foods such as caffeine, cholesterol, dietary fiber, other phytochemicals, all those plant chemicals. You know, everybody goes, I've got to get all my my plants, my phytochemicals. They're not essential. They are beneficial if you're getting your essential nutrients. But if you're not getting your essential nutrients, these don't help you age well. Generally, we think of food groups. Um, Let's see, it doesn't show up well on my screen. But you can see we've got protein, chicken breast. We've got the tomatoes, which are the, has the vitamin C. We've got corn with some of the carbohydrate. Uh, Starch, onions have a few other nutrients. Uh, Cheese is going to give calcium as well as protein. We've got the lettuce for some of our phytochemicals. It's about variety. There's no one food. There's no one food that has all of the essential nutrients in it. Now let's talk about bioavailability. Because we need to consume foods where the nutrients are bioavailable. And this is very commonly misunderstood. I know Popeye came along with all kinds of things saying that there's certain foods that were good but we'll show just how maybe he was a bit wrong. Nutrient bioavailability is the amount that's ingested, that's uh, ingested, digested, absorbed, and can be assimilated, can be used. It's not the amount that is absorbed. 
just, you know, you've got to do it all, right? Now, spinach. Spinach does not equal beef in any way, shape, or form. The same amount of iron in three ounces of spinach or three ounces of beef, they're relatively the same. But only 2% is available to the body and function in spinach. 20% in beef. That is a really big difference. Why I bring that up particularly is in the older generation, as we age, very commonly, we become anemic. And anemia in of itself oftentimes requires iron or B12. It's not just iron. But it is important that you continue to get it in the diet. And lots of groups are saying that beef, and I'm not paid by the beef board, okay, that beef is really, um, you know, the wrong thing to do, or red meat's the wrong thing to do. And I would guess a lot of you were raised eating it, and it might have actually helped you get to this point. Iron absorption inhibitors and enhancers. So calcium, that burger, you put a piece of cheese on it, you now decrease the absorption of that iron about 60% by adding cheese, because calcium is a strong inhibitor of iron. By taking calcium pills the same way, all right? Polyphenols, coffee, tea, fruits and vegetables. So once again, that's a lesser degree, but they do inhibit the amount of iron absorbed, particularly from non-heme iron. In other words, non-animal iron gets inhibited more. Dietary fiber also inhibits. So as we keep piling on the fiber... We're inhibiting the minerals we absorb. Phytates, as an example, beans. Now, all of you should have beans and whole grains in your diet, but if you go overboard, these also inhibit the iron. So when you think about beans, you might go, oh, red beans, red in color, more iron. Yeah, they do have more iron in them. But that red in color, which happens to be... um, an inhibitor of iron, you actually absorb less of the iron from the red beans than you do from white beans, even though the red contain more. Now, there's enhancers that can help you absorb. You've got red meats and chicken thigh, you know, anything that has the blood, essentially. Meat, fish, poultry. Now, for whatever reason, just having meat, fish, and poultry will help the iron be absorbed from plant products, for whatever reason, even a small amount of it. And then vitamin C. Vitamin C could help that spinach salad, you know, add a little mandarin orange on top of it, in order to help get some of that iron absorbed, or strawberries, something like that. These will help absorb the iron from plant products. What's it take to replace our tissues? Let's get down to the nitty-gritty here now. Water in the body is critical for healthy aging. It's normally around 66% in a healthy individual, with the brain requiring the largest amount. You don't have adequate fluid in the brain. What's going to end up happening? It's going to get thicker run the risk of TIAs, uh, transient ischemic strokes. You know, there's maybe you're not going to be thinking as straight. There are going to be problems. The blood is about 83% water. Once again, if the blood gets too thick, there are going to be some problems, like blood pressure is going to go up. That's going to be an issue. The heart, 80% water. Lungs, 90% water. When someone doesn't have enough overall fluid in the body... They're constantly, uh, I, I just always feel a congested chest, things like that. And that can actually be related to dehydration. Skeleton even needs some water. So does skin. As a person ages, total body water content can go down to 50%. And when the blood starts getting too thick 
or there's not enough blood going to the brain. Actually, I, I meant to put down the amount of water that's in muscle. I don't have that in the first column. But in fact, it's about 70 some percent. So when you need water in your blood, in order to be able to get it to the brain adequately, your muscle's going to break down because muscle has a high amount of water and it's the one thing that can break down without causing issues. It causes issues, but not the same level. So the effects of dehydration are many. Irritability. We're never irritable, right, as we get older. We're never irritable. No. Confused. Dizzy. Dizzy standing up, as an example. Loss of appetite. And this is really big as we age. How many people say to me, well, I eat as as much as my appetite. That doesn't meet your meaning, your nutrient needs. If you're dehydrated, your appetite is going to go down. Part of the reason for that is hydration, What when we digest food in our stomach, we need hydrochloric acid. Well, the hydro comes from water, and the chloride comes from sodium chloride equal to salt. We need that to be able to digest our food. So all of a sudden, as we're changing our diets around, we may, in fact, be decreasing that hydrochloric acid, and then it's not digesting, and we're not hungry, and then we're not getting our essential nutrients. You may also see that dry membranes, nose, mouth, less saliva. Gee, you're having a hard time swallowing those pills, having a real tough time getting them down. That could also be related to hydration. You don't cry. You don't really have tears anymore. You used to. You have decreased urine. Now, let me talk about decreased urine. Lots of seniors after dinner do not drink. Even I've heard physicians tell seniors, well, don't drink after dinner. That's not necessarily a good thing. Even just breathing, we lose a tenth of a pound of water just breathing every hour. Because if you're not drinking and you need more water, and I'll explain why we get up later at night to urinate, what's going to end up happening is it's going to start breaking down your muscle. It's not what we want to do. We want to build muscle to stay healthy and young. We need to maintain that muscle. Constipation. Constipation obviously requires a certain amount of of fluid to have things go through the gut. But the more fiber you eat, the more fluid you have to take in. People don't realize that. And so when I hear individuals say, oh, well, you know, it's normal to have a bowel movement every up to every three days, I'm sort of going like, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's going to make you irritable. <laughs> Guaranteed. People aren't going to want to be around you. But it's also putting pressure on the gut, potentially causing diverticulitis. You don't want to do that. Changes in skin texture. Low blood volume. Fast heart rate. Labored breathing. Maybe it's just walking, but it's still... Labored breathing, not a good thing. Too low and too high of blood pressure. We need to be in that middle. So if, if you go to bed and your blood pressure is really low at night, it's likely to be really high in the morning, especially if you get up and urinate a couple times, because the body has to get blood to the brain. This is the controlling mechanism of the body here. All right? And if your blood is really thick, it's going to have to pump harder to get that blood to the brain. So I had the luxury of my parents being out here for eight years with me. And they were very interested in things. And they took their blood pressure four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, tens a day for me, (laughs) being curious. And we realized that 
you know, with both of them, when their blood pressure was too low at night, in the morning, their blood pressure was sky high. So it was always about getting the blood pressure to a normal level before they went to bed. And then they woke up and they got up a lot less at night when the blood pressure is at a normal level. Inability to regulate body temperature. If you're cold all the time or you're hot all the time, you've got a blood volume issue. Could be caused by multiple different nutrients. Muscles get weak when you're dehydrated. You lose muscle and you get muscle spasms. You get cramps at night. And all of a sudden, how do you get rid of those cramps? I have to stand up at night. The leg cramps are so bad. That can also be related to dehydration. All right, there are a lot of factors that increase water needs. Medications. A lot of you are on diuretics. Well, that's great as long as your high blood pressure was actually due to having too much blood volume. Sometimes it's actually due to too little, but it's really hard to measure total blood volume in a person, so they don't. Hypertension can cause dehydration, decrease muscle mass because you don't have that ability for homeostasis, decrease kidney functions, added fiber, constipation, infection, and fever. All of these can affect. But what you need to understand about hydration, it's not just about drinking water. Because as you drink water, and that's related to your caloric intake, You need protein to hold the water in the blood. You need iron to hold the water in the blood. You need zinc to hold the water in the blood. Copper, these are all related to your total blood volume. Vitamin C, folic acid, B12, B6, all essential. And for a number of people, including seniors, I'm not telling you to go on sodium, but I'm just saying there are definitely individuals that adding a little bit of salt back into their diet helps them hold on to fluid. Maintaining muscles critical. I've said this before. And once again, gee, you need water, protein, iron, zinc, essentially many of the other essential nutrients. Believe it or not, muscle from an animal contains more essential nutrients than pretty much any other food. And whatever they said in Supersize Me, was completely wrong. I'm sorry, but that nutrition professional didn't have a clue what she was talking about, and I will stake my reputation on that. I was trying to be politically correct, but I'm not sure I am there. Okay, sarcopenia, 25-year-old, look at the muscle. As we get older, it's not as tight. So the loss of lean body mass called sarcopenia is due to a lack of physical activity and or protein. And so that can fill in either with some fat or to spaces. And what that also means is sometimes you'll see somebody, they look great, and a month later, their calf muscle is tiny. Well, it's because they had spaces in that area, and then all of a sudden when they needed that protein and they took it from the calf muscle, it just dwindled really quickly. How much protein is needed? There's been a great deal of debate, which is really ironic because over 30 years ago, they were saying that as we get older, in the 60s, we needed more protein. Then the dietary guidelines came out about eight years ago, and they said we need less. Then the physiologist came out and said, oh, that's interesting because as we, in fact, put seniors on protein at the level that was recommended within one month, they lost muscle mass, measurable. So we knew those recommendations were not correct. All of a sudden, there are a number of other people started doing research on seniors, and it's like, okay, We actually need more. What do we need? Well, the recommendation is somewhere around 1.5, 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram a day. But translated, because most of us don't think in kilograms, in terms of pounds, so if you weigh 100 pounds, 70 grams a day. Now, that's not 70 grams of meat, 
that's 70 grams of protein within the meat, which is actually only about 17 or 18 grams. Very different. All right? So that's a common misconception. We also need vitamins and minerals to prevent that decaying of our mitochondria. Bruce Ames was the researcher out of Berkeley who, in fact, uh, developed the first cancer test. And um, he's still, in his 90s, very active and publishing and doing research. And he brought up the fact that we're frequently missing these micronutrients from the diet. And that's a problem. So iron, zinc, biotin, pentothenic acid, as an example, are some of them. But common medical conditions that could also be related. So iron deficiency is the number one nutrient deficiency worldwide in America and in the elderly. Number one. I know I am constantly told that I obsess on iron, but yeah, because it's number one. Anemia, cognitive function, all of those neurochemicals are really critical because they, iron is a cofactor in chemical depression. You don't form the neurochemicals to not be depressed. Esophageal reflux, in other words, gee, I'm not digesting well enough and it's not getting down. Once again, that can be related to iron. Fatigue, well, I have 20-year-olds telling me, I'm 20, I'm getting older, that's why I'm tired. Yeah, right, not even, you know. But if we keep our blood volume up and our muscle mass up, we're a lot less tired too. Gallbladder issues have been related to iron deficiency, headaches, hypothyroid, insomnia, insulin resistance, restless leg syndrome. You know, you're sleeping there and all of a sudden your leg kicks out, kicks out, you know, like that can be a factor. Or if you're sitting in the chairs, especially some of these, if you're a shorter individual, you may realize that it's pressing on the back of your leg. And all of a sudden, in order to get blood volume going, you're bouncing your knee around. That's also a relation to not having enough blood volume. Uh, Weight gain. Gee, interesting enough, without adequate iron, your muscle can break down to dump iron into the blood. And if your muscle breaks down, your calorie needs go down. And in fact, you can end up gaining fat, weight, because of an iron deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency. Everybody goes, well, it's Hawaii, I'm out in the sun, not a problem. In fact, it can be a problem because what we get from the sun is the inactive form of vitamin D, but it in fact converts to the active form and it needs iron. The fingernails, you may all look at your fingernails now. Everybody look at their fingernails, all right? So fingernails where someone has been iron deficient for a long period of time are flat. They may even have a curve in them that's going the wrong direction, you know, like it's flipping up on the ends. There also may be striations that are longwise. Now, those striations are inadequate blood volume getting to the fingertips. And you can see over time, as people get adequate diets that have adequate blood volume, those striations go away. But once again, it's also iron status and protein status. Main causes of iron deficiency, insufficient dietary iron, low bioavailability. If you you happen to be vegetarian, your iron requirement is double, almost double what it is. And that's a whole lot of spinach with a whole lot of mandarin orange on it. Blood loss is also another way. We may not even realize we're losing additional blood in the GI tract. Is an iron deficiency easily recognized? Well, the medical belief is that The body is adequate. Iron stores are identified with anemia. Is that true? The physiological reality is that the standard tests may or may not be reliable for you. 
And I'll show you some data that Brian Hill, my graduate student, did. He looked at this very large database of, uh, called NHANES. He had over 5,000 total individuals that he looked at that were bona fide iron deficient by a, a number called serum ferritin. It's an indicator of iron deficiency. And when it's low, it's a real iron deficiency. When it's high, it could just mean that you're in inflammation or that you didn't eat the day before or you went for a run, different things that can cause it to go up. But he looked at only the individuals that were bona fide low in iron. And lo and behold, at the young age, over 75% of the individuals were missed by the standard hemoglobin and hematocrit tests. So that's in the blue. And then doing all the tests from what's called a CBC. When you go to the doctors, they almost always do a, a complete blood count, a CBC. And when they looked at everything, they were still missing more than 50%. Now, over the age of 59, there weren't as many individuals in that group, but they still found over 50%, and this, is, this happens to be just females, but we saw the same thing in males. We saw that, in fact, individuals were missed over 50% of the time with hemoglobin and hematocrit, and just under 50% using the whole the whole blood count, which most physicians, and this is based on uh, research data, do not look at all of them. Different uh, types of physicians look at different numbers in this. So you may go, or you may go to the blood bank, and they say you're fine, but in fact, you could be low in iron. Could that chronic cough be a nutrient deficiency? Yes. They've shown it both in iron deficiency and in vitamin B12 deficiency, both of these things can cause more of that chronic cough, but it's more related likely to blood volume because both iron and vitamin B12 and deficiencies change your blood volume and the quality of your blood and how much water you can hold on. Choline. Choline is really important both for young brains, for older brains as well. One egg a day, the yolk, has in fact half of the choline. Half of the choline. The information about eggs causing high cholesterol was not true. The Heart Association now says there's new data showing that it's not true. Um, an egg a day is beneficial. Otherwise, you need to eat 2,700 calories a day in order to get your choline. I don't think many of us are eating 2,700 calories a day. Okay, and now we've got that exercise. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. There you go. Even with all the essential nutrients, you've got to work that muscle. You've got to walk lifting weights, even simple things. All of you probably have at home a can of something that weighs a pound. There's your pound weight. Sitting there watching TV? Okay, lift it as far as you can. If you want to start slow, which I would suggest, get an empty bottle that has a handle and a tight lid, put a tablespoon of water in it, Start for a couple days, add a tablespoon of water, start for a couple days. But this is important. We don't want to hurt ourselves in pulling any ligaments. So you start slow and you start adding on. And pretty soon those gallon jugs are just lifting up and they're almost eight pounds. So there you go. Exercise, social network, prevent blood pressure from going too low. These were all found with a group of individuals with research out of California, University of California, Irvine. This group of individuals they had been monitoring for years, these are individuals that had good brain function, ir irregardless of those brain tangles that theoretically are related to Alzheimer's. And they found that individuals that even in their late 90s that were still doing well and they were monitoring them every six months, 
Exercise, social network, prevent blood pressure from going too low. They all drank coffee. They had alcohol in moderation. Okay, it's not a nutrient, but it could be helpful. And overweight but not obese. Those were the things that these individuals that did really healthy aging had. Exercising to maintain or even build muscle is important. Exercise in moderation is good. We don't have to go out and run marathons. Walk every day. If you can do 10,000 steps, that's great. If you can't, whatever you can. Have something that maybe you monitor yourself, like a pedometer. Overly leanness without adequate muscle can be problematic. It's not healthful. Muscles, your immune system. Can I get all the essential nutrients from a vegetarian diet? Can you eat 2,700 calories a day? Can't get it with less than that. Not to maintain that homeostasis. We've, we've done some modeling. But it depends on your body size, your calorie needs. Males do much better than females. They've got more muscle mass. For years, they didn't have periods. You know... <laughs> On a whole, they do better as a vegetarian than females do. Females run out. Vegetarian diets, you require more calories for the same grams of protein. So it's the lean beef, chicken, fish, egg, cottage cheese, 8 calories per gram of protein, dairy and tofu, 16, beans, 24, grains, 30, nuts, 36 calories per gram of protein. Depending on what your protein needs are, that's an issue. So, bottom line, variety, proportion, balance. Determine your protein needs. This was your homework. Minimum energy. How much are you, what are you doing? What are you taking in? That'll determine your water needs. Choline source. Do you have one? Tofu also has choline, but not at the same levels. You should have 50 to 80 grams of fat a day on a whole. Carbohydrate and fiber are important, maybe a little less than they're being pushed, and all those micronutrients. There are no good foods. There are no bad foods. We can make better choices, though, by having that variety, moderation, and appropriate proportions. So on your homework... Some of you may have done it. Some of you may not have done it. But I want to at least talk it through. Why I gave you such a detailed homework assignment is people will always call me up and say, how much protein do I need? Well, I, I don't know. You know, what's your height, your weight, your, your age? I literally have to work out how many calories people are doing because that all relates. But your protein requirement is based on your body weight. No matter what you hear on television that say you only need 46 grams of protein a day. That used to be what was recommended for a young person at the weight of 110 pounds, a young female. It's not what we need. So you should have filled that out. And then I gave a chart that essentially shows for that 1.6 grams, that's the number I typically use in clinic, How many grams of protein do you need? And vegetarians, because they only digest about 60% or 70% that protein, so you need even more. And then there's a certain amount of calories you need to get in to maintain that muscle mass. Now, this is the hardest thing for us. Because if you're large and you need to maintain a high muscle mass, or a muscle mass, and you need a lot of calories. So as an example, the minimum number of calories here, if you're 170 pounds, the minimum number of calories are over 2,300. And if you're eating 1,500, you're just going to keep breaking down that muscle. So there's got to be ways to exercise. That's why exercise is so critical. We know that if you go up to the two grams of protein per kilogram body weight, 
It's a higher protein. And your kidneys are good, right? You need to make sure that your kidneys are functioning normally. Then a higher amount with exercise, you don't need quite as many calories. Okay, I put in fluid, that Bristol stool chart. Didn't want to put it up too big, but, you know, you should look at what your stool looks like. And the reality is if it's one, two, or three, you need more fluid in your diet. If it's five, six, or seven, you're already having issues happening, either with your medication, maybe you're lactose intolerant, and lots of medications have lactose in it, or your gut health isn't very good. Four is the only normal one. Four is the only normal one. Daily bowel movement is pretty important. The number of calories you consume will affect what your fluid intake should be. All right? But, of course, if you're out there playing tennis, my dad played tennis until he was 87, and he did a lot of perspiring, and he needed a lot more fluid. You know, so you should also keep that in mind as well. These are the minimum levels. So with that, mahalo, and I'll take any questions that you have.